Hi, welcome to GraphQL A Primer. I'm Butch Clark, and in this course, you'll get a good overview of what GraphQL is. You'll start to see why it's such a hot topic, and you'll get an idea about what kinds of problems it addresses. You'll also get exposure to tools you can use as you start developing or managing the development of GraphQL services of your own. I've developed and deployed both JavaScript and Java Spring Boot applications that expose GraphQL interfaces. I predominantly work on the middle tier and back-end systems, and for several years, that's meant REST interfaces on microservices. I have to say I love the flexibility that GraphQL offers, but we'll get into that shortly. This course will be organized into the following sections. Introduction, which we're covering now. The next section is, what is it? Here we get a general idea about the overview of what GraphQL is. Next is history. Very briefly, you'll get an idea about where GraphQL came from. Next, what are the benefits? In this section, we'll get into the specifics of why GraphQL is such a great interface to follow in the right situations. It fits really well in most use cases, but not so well in some others. Next up, we look at implementations. In this section, we'll look at the popular implementations of the GraphQL specification. Which of these you might use will depend upon your environment and which language you're using. And finally, tools and next steps. Here we'll examine a few tools that will help you develop and debug your GraphQL interfaces, along with some ideas for next steps. Thanks for spending some of your time here. I hope you end up as excited about GraphQL as I am. In the next section, we'll look at GraphQL. What is it? GraphQL, what is it? At its core, GraphQL is nothing more than a specification. It describes how clients and servers communicate to pass information back and forth. That's it. In that respect, GraphQL and REST are similar. They both define a commonly understood mechanism for, say, a user in a browser to request a particular bit of information from the server that supplies the data. Let's take a hypothetical example and see what this looks like. I'm a user that has browsed to the Definitive Superhero Information Repository website. I really want to know the list of names of all the superheroes that the site contains. The website has a button for just such a query. When I click it, a request message will be constructed that describes what I'm asking for. It could look something like this. Now, that's not quite enough information for a GraphQL request, however. In addition to the operation we want to invoke, in other words, here we want to execute the superheroes operation that will gather information about all the characters it knows about, we also need to supply what information we want returned. For example, let's say we want the name returned. So our complete, albeit simple GraphQL request message could look something like this. So a GraphQL request will consist of at least two parts. You specify the operation you want to perform and you specify the shape of the information you want returned. In our example, we requested the superheroes operation that gathers all known characters. Then, we specified we only want the name field of each character found returned to us. Now, you might be wondering, how do we know what operations are available and also what fields are available for the response message? Perfect timing. Let's talk about that now. GraphQL is a strictly schema-based interface. There is no guessing about what operations a data server will expose, and there is no ambiguity about what fields an operation can return. Every operation 
that a GraphQL server accepts must be described in a schema. Likewise, the fields available to be returned from any given operation must also be completely described in a schema. So what does a schema look like? Well, they're nothing more than text files formatted in something called schema definition language. Really, it's very close to JSON documents, but not quite the same. Let's take a look. For our imaginary website, the schema might look like this. First, we see there's a single operation for query called superheroes. What follows is exactly what the operation will return. In this case, it's an array of objects of the character type, which actually makes sense. You can think of GraphQL types as object definitions, similar to Java class definitions, for example. Next, we see the character type definition. It has two fields that show both the field name and data type. You'll see one for name and one for age. The only thing that might be strange is the exclamation point after string. This just says that the field named name will contain string values, and the exclamation point says that every field that returns must contain an actual value. In other words, null values are not supported and not allowed for the name field. The second field, named age, will contain numeric values. Since there's no exclamation point here, values for ages are allowed to be missing or null. You'll often hear about data services supporting CRUD functionality. That stands for Create, Retrieve, Update, and Delete. Our GraphQL query operations satisfy the Retrieve functionality of CRUD type operations. Before we wrap up this section then, let's see how we round out the rest of the CRUD functionality. There's a second main kind of request we can make. In GraphQL, we call them mutations. A mutation is any request that causes some kind of change in the data state on the server. These are also defined as operations and are also strictly schema-based. For our example of the earlier case, we could have a mutation operation called add superhero. We could pass in the information we want added, such as you know, the new character name and age. For mutations, you're not limited to just adding either. We could also change an existing character in the system, as well as we could delete one. With mutations, we round out the typical CRUD operations for data management. There's one more kind of request that can be made to GraphQL servers. They're called subscriptions. We won't go into much detail here except to say that subscriptions allow a client to subscribe to a GraphQL server for specific conditions. When the condition is met, a message will be generated on the server side and sent to the client. It's more of a push model here. For example, it could, be re it could be possible for a client to subscribe to our server and request a notification every time a new character is created in the system. This is a very powerful feature. Now, you probably won't see it nearly as much as you will queries and mutations, however. In summary, GraphQL is a specification that describes how clients and servers communicate. For a client to understand what it can do, and to understand what it can request back, GraphQL re relies on schemas to define both. The format schemas can take is defined in the schema definition language. GraphQL also supports all CRUD functionality. In the next section, we'll take a quick look at the history of GraphQL and how it came about and a little bit about why. In this section, We'll take a quick look at how GraphQL came into being. GraphQL was created by Facebook as an internal tool 
to address difficulties they found in the overall software development and deploy process. Facebook released GraphQL as an open source project. The story goes that Facebook had a large number of REST-based microservices with front-end applications that they would interact with. Over time, as requirements change on a front end, for example, a certain screen now needs one additional piece of information, changes would need to be made not just on the front end code, but also to the data service, the microservice in a lot of cases, that supplies the data. This does a couple negative and usually expensive things. It causes a direct dependency link between the front ends and the middle tier slash back end. It causes work to be done in the middle tier to satisfy exactly what data the front end wishes to receive now. That means that in addition to the software deployment for the front end, you may also need to do a full dev cycle, including testing, for the middle tier and possibly even back end systems. One obvious way to make sure the REST controller doesn't need to change is to throw any bit of data the client might need into the response. This way, no matter what the client may need, it will have it. However, depending on what kind of data request it's for, this can mean very wasteful calls and unnecessary work on the client side to then sift through the, the larger response and pick out exactly what it wants. Another common solution to a client needing more or different information is to have it call multiple REST endpoints. In some cases, these can be run in parallel so it doesn't extend the time it takes for the client to return to the caller, um, a user that clicked a button, for example. However, it is common to have these stacked REST calls run in series because you need the information back from the first REST call to be able to construct the request call for the second and subsequent REST calls. So GraphQL was born from the experience developing and deploying REST interfaces. It solves many of the wasteful aspects of the front-end REST server configurations. In the next section, we'll compare and contrast REST and GraphQL and we'll look at some of the main benefits we can get from taking a GraphQL approach. In this section, we'll build on where we left off in the last section and go into a bit more detail. Firstly, let's compare REST with GraphQL. Both specify ways for clients to interact with servers. In both, you typically make a request to a specific HTTP endpoint and get back some kind of response. REST and GraphQL both support different HTTP methods, such as GET and POST. While it's not required for a REST server, many use JSON messages to communicate requests and responses, just like many GraphQL interfaces do. Now let's contrast REST with GraphQL. REST is all about resources. A REST endpoint will use its URL as a way of communicating what resource is being addressed. For example, a server that returns information about doomsday devices may support an HTTP GET request at the URL HTTPS slash slash whatever the website is slash doomsday devices. When the REST server sees a request at this address, it performs the backend work and returns a canned response. The canned response is what's important here. This means that the REST server will typically build the same response message for any caller. The only thing that will change will be the values in the message. In addition, the REST server is free to send back whatever it wants, in whatever shape it wants. GraphQL, on the other hand, is not resource-based, but is schema-based. Every operation, both queries and mutations, will be fully described in a schema file. In addition, the requests and responses will be fully described in schema files as well.
This definitely restricts what the GraphQL server can respond with. Unlike in a REST service, the GraphQL service must respond with a message that satisfies the schema definition. The power of being defined in a schema, however, is that a single larger GraphQL type can be described. Now, when a new front end comes online, it requests exactly the fields it wants, and the existing front ends continue to request the fields that they want, and there is no work needed on the microservice whatsoever. So, in our doomsday device scenario earlier, we can define a type of doomsday device and another type of villain. In the schema, we can logically tie them together, almost like creating SQL tables with foreign keys. With the two types defined and linked together, the client can make a single query call to the GraphQL service and get back exactly the data it needs. Now let's talk a little bit about the use cases for GraphQL and REST. To be honest, it, in a lot of cases it really doesn't matter if you use REST or GraphQL. Both will support requests and responses for your data. Where GraphQL shines is when you have multiple types of clients asking for varying subsets of different kinds of related data. With GraphQL, you can define a set of data types with all the fields your client needs and link together in a logical manner. When an individual client makes a request, it asks for just those fields that it needs right then. A different client asks for a different subset of fields. The GraphQL server happily builds exactly the response that each client requests with the same code base. It also makes it so that the server returns only the data that the client needs. This can save not only network traffic, but also in expensive backend data calls. The server will only gather the data that the client has asked for. I've run across one area where REST is definitely a better choice. Since REST is not bound by any schema, either for the request or the response, it can accept any kind of message a client throws at it. It can also generate responses that vary call to call. For example, one system I worked on recently was a large order processing system. The overall order fulfillment flow was determined by a series of event messages that were received. Each type of event message was unique, but it had a common base message. When the REST controller received an event message, it interrogated the payload to see if it could tell what kind of event it was. When it figured out what it was, it cast the message to a particular event type and continued processing. Since REST servers are free to accept and respond with whatever they want, this is a great use case for a REST controller. While it's probably possible, it would have been very cumbersome with a GraphQL interface. Now let's talk a little bit about using REST and GraphQL. One other quick point here, you can, and I have, deployed services with both GraphQL and REST endpoints. There is no reason that you have to choose absolutely one or the other. You can pick the best fit for your use case. In the next section, let's take a look at some implementations. In this section, let's take a look at some implementations of GraphQL. As we said earlier, GraphQL is a specification. It merely describes what you should do in order to follow the GraphQL way of doing things. You absolutely could use the specification to develop your own services that adhere to the GraphQL spec. However, various teams of people have developed frameworks to make your job much easier. They're available for most programming languages, and some actually have more than one popular solution.
If you're developing your GraphQL server in JavaScript, you really have a couple of popular options. The first we'll mention is Apollo. This may be the most used library in production today for GraphQL. In addition to the open source library that you'll use, they have developed an entire ecosystem around GraphQL, including things like a schema registry. You can find more information here. You can download the Apollo Node.js GraphQL library to help you get started developing at the following GitHub repository. There's a link at the top of the README to their excellent documentation. Another very popular library for JavaScript is Relay. Relay was developed by Facebook and committed to open source. You can find more information at the GitHub repository here. They also have nice documentation, including examples of use cases where GraphQL can solve issues seen in REST deployments. If you're developing Java microservices, there's a Spring library called GraphQL Spring Boot and an associated tools library. You can find a link to it in the Maven repository here. Like the GraphQL libraries, this library can read schema files in the project and automatically generate Java source code to support the GraphQL operations and types. With surprisingly little code, you can develop a complete Java Spring Boot based microservice that supports a complex GraphQL interface. I've personally developed both Spring Boot and Apollo-based JavaScript servers. These implementation libraries can make developing GraphQL servers very fast. If you find yourself needing to develop GraphQL interfaces in other languages, just do a quick search. You'll find common libraries for virtually every library, including Python, Ruby, even Clojure. The overall development approach will be to determine what language you need to deploy, then find an appropriate implementation library for your situation. Once everything is wired up, you can determine what data and data models you'll have to work with. Next, you'll create a GraphQL schema for your operations and for your types. Finally, you'll write the bits of code that actually gather the required data for each of your individual GraphQL types. The rest of the functionality, including things like packaging up responses that contain only the fields the caller requested, will be taken care of by the implementation library. All of the popular implementation libraries make it very smooth and easy to develop GraphQL servers. In the next section, We'll take a quick look at some of the tools that might be helpful for you and some of the next steps and where you can get more information. In our final section, let's take a look at a couple of tools you might find useful, then we'll look at some options for next steps. The tool I've probably spent the majority of my time in while developing GraphQL interfaces is called Graphical. It's an Electron application that you can find more information about here. Okay, so let's just take a minute and look at Graphical. Um, I have a GraphQL server running on my local uh, laptop here. And we can go to localhost slash 9000 and we go to slash graphical. That's where the, the graphical server is listening. And so this is the graphical tool, and what you can see on the right-hand side, it gives you documentation. It, it interrogates your GraphQL service as it's running. And in this case, you can see I have a, a query type for the queries and a mutation type for the mutations. If we look at query, we can see that these are the different operations that have been defined in my local GraphQL interface. If we wanted to, for example, as, it, as you can see over here, there is a characters 
operation that's shown here. And then we have the list of fields that we want returned. This is all built by the schema. So if we look at the character here, this will take us to a link. These are the fields that have been defined for this character. So now we can execute that query against our local GraphQL server just by hitting the Go button. And you can see that this returns the list of all the characters that it knows about, plus the name attribute for each one. Now, if we wanted to change this, it's just as simple as saying, let's say we want to ask for height as well. We execute the query again, and now we can see that it returns that information. This is really um, this is a really good tool to use when you are developing, especially when you're developing your services, because it gives you a chance to interact directly with the service the way it's defined in the schemas. Another nice tool that can build a diagram of your GraphQL interface is called Voyager. You can find the open source code here. So now if we want to take a quick look at Voyager, um, I also have that set up here on my, my local server. And if we go to our local server slash Voyager, this is the interface that comes up for Voyager. Uh, what we can see is we ha it, it also interrogates the schemas and it builds a nice graphical interface that shows you how what the objects are, what the types rather are, and how those uh, relate to each other. So for example, we can see that this is the character type that we had been looking at just a minute ago. And we can see that, for example, uh, a character can have an array of uh, associations, called associations, it's a, an array of groups. The group object is, or group type rather, is defined here. And you can see that the, the associations has a direct link to this type. So this is how you make those, those logical ties between the two. So what we could do here then is after we've made these, these logical ties between the two types, we could go back and let's go to the graphical interface. And in this case, you can see in, if we go to character, you can see that it has friends as a field. Friends is a, an array um, noted by the square brackets. It's an array of character objects. So all we have to do then is ask for friends in addition to like the name field that we wanted. Since this is a, a different type, we need to specify what fields in that type we want returned. So for example, we could, um, we could ask for the friend's name and the orientation. So now when we execute this, we see that the first character has the name displayed and then it has an array of characters and this is the this is a link to a separate character type that is noted as a friend of this character and you can see that we indeed had the name and orientation returned for the friend and that goes down through each of these that that we've asked for Depending upon the phase of development and testing you're in, you may find other tools useful too, like GraphQL Faker to mock GraphQL endpoints and Swagger to GraphQL to convert existing REST services to GraphQL. Also, if you're using Chrome as your browser during development, which a lot of us do, there's a nice extension called GraphQL Network. This provides the developer extension tab that shows the GraphQL requests that have been made, including what the operation was and the, the requested fields to come back. Um, 
I don't use this all that often. I'm not sure it's terribly um, mature. Uh, I've had a, I've found it a little bit buggy at times, uh, but when it works, it's it's a very nice tool. So that concludes our primer on GraphQL. Uh, basically, it's a a fast overview of what it is, how we can use it, a little bit about where it came from, and in large part why you would want to use it. I'm really excited about it. I, I have found great success with GraphQL so far, and um, I definitely think it's worth looking into. I appreciate you spending some time with us, and I hope to see you soon.